Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. Let's talk about phase in this video, a often misunderstood concept, and often it's the culprit, the reason for an undiagnosed problem in our room. Or is it? <laughs> uh, that's what I'm going to demystify for you in this video. So we're going to talk about, obviously, what a phase issue is, where they pop up, and most importantly, how you know if you actually have a phase issue. But before I do that, I want to make you aware of my Phantom Speaker Test Workshop. One of the most difficult things in setting up a new studio, especially if you're just working from a spare bedroom, from your basement, or just some room that you're kind of adapting to be your home studio, especially if it's oddly shaped, is figuring out where to actually put your desk and your speakers in this room because there are so many kind of rules of thumb to follow facing the short wall, uh, a certain distance from the wall. There are all these kind of rules of thumb thrown around, but if your room isn't a shoebox shape, how do you figure out how to do this properly? So that's why I created the Phantom Speaker Test Workshop that you can sign up for free at the link in the description. This is a short five video video course that walks you through figuring out which side to face in your room, where to place your desk and how to set up your speakers correctly. It's a simple two-step listening test. So in the first step, you identify where the ideal listening position is in your room. And then in the second step, you set up your speakers to make sure that you really get the best stereo image, the best sound stage from your speakers so that you have the right distance from your speakers to the walls, to your ears, and obviously from each other. And so that's what the Phantom Speaker Test Workshop is all about. If that's you, if you're setting up a new studio, if you've got issues with your stereo image, typically this is that you can't tell spaces properly, that you can't tell depth properly, that you don't know how to pan properly, or that panning kind of ends up or puts instruments in places where you didn't expect. That's probably because you don't have your speakers set up correctly. And that's what this workshop will solve for you. It will guide you through figuring out what the problem is and make sure that they're set up absolutely perfectly as best as possible in the room that you're in. That's kind of the most important part about this. Yeah. So again, if that's you, make sure you check that out at the link in the description. So let's talk about phase issues. What is a phase issue? Well, it is if two coherent signals overlap, but with a phase mismatch. Okay, so the easiest way to imagine this is two sine waves, same amplitude, and they just kind of perfectly match. Then you get interference, constructive interference. They add together. And if they're slightly shifted in relation, in relation to each other, the, the summation might actually end up canceling the signal out. And that's when you end up with a phase issue. Yeah. So the typical problem there is the interference that, ge that gets created, in particular if it's destructive interference. And then you get a comb filter, typically. That's what you see in the frequency response. Yeah? So that, in a nutshell, is a phase issue. Two signals, two coherent signals that get added together, but they are out of phase, and so you get destructive interference, cancellation, and a comb filter. What does this sound like? Well, if you've ever used a chorus or a flanger or a phaser as a kind of a creative effect in your music production, then you know what a phase issue sounds like. The important bit about this is that it only occurs if those two signals have the same amplitude, right? Obviously, if one is much, much lower in amplitude, in volume, if you will, than the other. It can't kind of destruct the other one. It can't sum or add anything, both positive or negative, to the other signal when they get summed together. And obviously, that phase relationship really matters. Let's have a quick look at this phase wheel from Merlane Van Veen. I'll link to his website in the description as well. If you are interested in educating yourself on anything audio related, his website, and to be honest, also obviously his videos and his seminars are absolutely fantastic. Uh, if you are 
really interested in the engineering behind sound, behind acoustics. It's one of the best resources out there. And so he created, or maybe he actually took this from Bobby McCarthy. I'm not entirely sure. To be honest, it doesn't matter. What we're looking at here is simply what happens to the result when two signals, coherent signals, get summed together. And here at the very top on the left, there's a zero degree difference in phase between these two signals that are summed together. So they're basically right on top of each other, right? Again, picture the sine wave, two sine waves, and they're right on top of each other. There is zero shift between them. We measure this in degrees because 360 degrees is a full cycle shift, right? So we start at zero degrees and we get a 6 dB summation increase in amplitude through the summation between these two signals. As these two signals drift apart, at 55 degrees we still have 5 dB of summation. At 90 degrees we still have 3, dB, uh, 3 decibels of summation. Only at 120 degrees do you actually get 0 decibels of summation, right? And then going on to 150 minus 6 decibels of summation. And then at 100 degrees phase shift, they're basically perfectly misaligned. You technically get absolute cancellation. This doesn't happen in practice, but that's what the maths tells us. The important bit here to understand is that this phase shift, the mismatch between these two signals, really only becomes properly destructive once they're 120 degrees or more out of phase. Yeah, you can see this here on the right. He calls this the coupled zone, right? So two thirds of our potential phase shift, they're still coupled, coupled, these two signals, and only in the kind of one third remaining uh, of phase shift, of phase mismatch, do you actually get an uncoupled signals and you actually get cancellation, yeah? So what I'm trying to say here basically is that it takes quite a lot of mismatch for the cancellation to actually become a problem, yeah? So that's the second component of this to understand, yeah? Amplitude is important. These two signals have to be roughly at the same amplitude or volume. And the phase mismatch has to be quite drastic, 120 degrees or more. So where do phase issues pop up? Well, <laughs> to be frank, all over the place. They're everywhere in acoustics. Remember, it has, it's, they appear anytime two coherent signals sum together, basically meet, and they are at roughly the same amplitude or at least kind of in the ballpark. And also the, uh, the phase mismatch is above 120 degrees. And that's when you really get serious cancellations, which is what I would call a phase issue. Yeah, To technically a positive summation is also a phase issue, but we don't call it that for some reason. So where does that appear? As I said, everywhere. Think about any time a reflection from your room meets the direct sound from your speakers. You get interference, you get a comb filter, and you technically have a phase issue. Where else does this pop up? Standing waves, room resonances, right? When the sine wave, when the frequency fits perfectly between two opposing walls, it reflects back in on itself, on top of itself, and this is actually technically the worst kind, right? Because they are exactly 180 degrees out of phase. That's when you get a standing, that's what a standing wave does. And that's when you get kind of the worst type of phase issue. So th those are two examples that we all know. The reflection phase issue, nobody would call that a phase issue. So that I'm going to just say that's the not so obvious kind, yeah? Standing waves, we all know, we all think they're very problematic. That's the obvious kind of phase issue. So what other examples do we have? Well, in the not so obvious kind, there is simply the summation of the two speakers at your ears. Yeah. So if the two speakers play the same signal and the distance to the ears are slightly different, you get a slight phase mismatch, therefore interference and cancellation, and therefore a comb filter.
Nobody would call that a phase issue, but it definitely appears. When do you hear that? Well, if you sign up to my phantom speaker test, there is a mono pink noise file in there with a simple step-by-step -step process to help you center your phantom center. And that just simply involves playing this mono pink noise file and then moving your head. And you will hear the comb filter shifting in frequency because of the distance change between the speakers and your ear as you move your head. So that's a prob probably not so obvious phase issue that always happens in your studio whenever you move your head and it's always there. What about the more obvious kind though? So we already had standing waves, but another one that is very obvious tends to be the floor reflection. Yeah, so this is a standard reflection, if you will. It's the reflection bouncing off of the floor and then mixing with the direct sound at your ear. And in many cases that can create pretty drastic notches in the frequency response at usually somewhere around 100 hertz yeah, because of the distances involved. Same goes, by the way, for the desk reflection. Same principle, slightly shorter distances. That's why that phase issue and the resulting comb filter ends up higher up in the frequency spectrum. Another one that is often misunderstood is speaker boundary interference, right? So any time, any time we have the speaker interfering with a, a, a surface in close proximity, usually that's the wall behind the speakers, the front wall in your studio. In that case though, the interference, the, the two signals, they don't meet at the ear, they meet at the speaker membrane. Yeah, and so uh, the maths changes slightly because the distances involved are all in relation to the speaker membrane. But in essence, it is still the same principle. It is sound reflecting off of a surface, bouncing back to the speaker and interfering with the direct sound, basically at the instant where it leaves the speaker, if you will. And it creates a comb filter the characteristic of this particular comb filter is that it is again typically in the lower frequencies so somewhere between 70 to 100 hertz very often um, and that it is kind of characterized by a first very deep notch and followed by some slightly shallower notches uh, shallower dips in the frequency response as you go up in frequency now i call this the obvious kind but in many cases, it's not actually that obvious because it's actually quite difficult to hear distinct and narrow but deep notches in the frequency response. Uh, you really have to hit that frequency quite perfectly with the music that you're listening to in order for that notch to become apparent. Still, I'm going to throw it in the obvious phase issue bucket. Another quite obvious one, potentially, is if you're using a subwoofer. So tying a subwoofer together with the speakers, aka the satellites, and at the, in the crossover region, if two coherent signals are played by the speaker and the sub, and the sub isn't positioned correctly, or the polarities, aka phase, isn't set properly on the sub, you can actually get a pretty drastic phase mismatch between the speaker and the sub in the crossover region. That's one of the main things that we're trying to get right when we tie in a sub into our systems, we want, we want to phase align the sub with the speakers in order for there to be no destructive interference between the two. And if you get that wrong, it can be pretty obvious. So one thing to watch out for when you're thinking about phase issues, and I briefly mentioned it before, is actually the point in space where these two signals meet. Yeah? With standard reflections, it's usually the ear, right? So we're talking about mirror point reflections from the side walls, the desk reflection, the floor reflection, all these things, uh, all these wave fronts interfere with the direct sound at our ear. So it's that point in space that interests us in terms of where the cancellation happens. But for example, with speaker boundary interference, it is the speaker membrane where the interference happens. And so that's the point of space in space that interests us. So you always have to think about that as well. Where in, in space are you actually sampling the the, the match, the meeting of these two signals. So how do you know if you have a phase issue? Well, first of all, you got to ask yourself, are there two signals meeting somewhere? And these two signals have to be coherent. They basically have to be the same. Yeah, 
And when we're talking about reflections, it is the same signal because it still emanates from the speaker, just, get, just gets reflected off of a particular surface. If we're talking about speaker sub-integration, it's the same signal because the music that gets played through our system usually is split up to the speakers and the sub, so it's the same signal. So just ask yourself that, right? If you're wondering if you have a phase issue, ask yourself, are there actually two coherent signals interfering? If that's not the case, then it cannot be a phase issue. The second part of it is that if it is a noticeable or if it is a problematic issue, let's say, then you can probably hear it. Yeah. If you've ever wired up a speaker in a stereo setup the wrong way around, you know exactly what the worst case of phase issue sounds like when it's polarity inverted. Yeah. It's 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 unbearable. You can basically, you can't listen to it. Or if you've ever listened to a chorus or flanger or phaser, you know how that sounds. So if you're moving your head and you can, you get that kind of chorusing effect, that is a phase issue. If neither of those is the case, then you probably don't have a phase issue. Okay. So don't blame an undiagnosed potential problem on phase. Yeah, it probably has absolutely nothing to do with phase. Okay, I hope that gives you a quick kind of guideline on how to think about this and understand phase. And just to realize that phase issues, phase issues are everywhere. They're all around us in the studio all the time. And uh, the problem isn't if or you have phase issues or not. The problem is are they noticeable? Yeah, And there are some very particular ones and you probably know about them already. With that, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.